Hello microgrinders, Elton from microgrinder.com back again with the final video in our series of how to beat Bovada 6 Max 5 and L. So I considered doing another live play video or a hand history review video, but I figured after a total of seven videos so far, I think this eighth video with a bit of a conclusion um, would be a good way to close out the series just to give you some insight on how my play went over the series. And also I forgot to include in my first introductory video some ideas on why we should bet, um, when we should call, and when we should be folding. So I wanted just to end the series on that. Um, you know, I figured overall this has been a pretty good series. Started off with an introductory lecture on my ideas for some strategies for success and some sketches on some six max opening ranges. And then we did six videos of live play where I went through and did live play at Bovada 6 Max 5 and L and for our last video went ahead and did a hand history review and so hopefully that was informative and I think this video will be a good way to close out the the whole series doing just a short 10 to 15 minute um, summary on how my play went and how well I did and also closing it out for our Bovada 5 and L players um, some basic reasons for when we should be betting when we should be calling and maybe when we should be folding as well so let's go ahead and get started. So series results. I only played a very small sample size of hands. Um, I recorded most of the videos back to back and most of them were only 30 minutes. Um, for the entire video series it's been less than a week from recording the first video to recording this last video and again I'm only a recreational player you know I play anywhere from 20 minutes to an hour and a half at a time for a regular session and I play on the average maybe two to three nights a week um, sometimes I won't play at all but I played a lots of short sessions uh, specifically for this video series um, I played a very small sample size I played roughly 1200 hands for this series and over those 1200 hands um, my basic conclusion is it was a positive variance session overall for that 12,000 hands. I was definitely on a heater, so I was running well. Yeah, I did run bad for, you know, one of my videos and for a portion of some of my sessions, but for the most part, um, I ran really well. So definitely can't complain about that. Um, if you look at the win rate, 43 big blinds over 100, that's just absurd. Um, that's not sustainable. So, you know, if I continue to play and I just track these stats, I can assume that my big blind per 100 is definitely just going to go down and down and down until it evens out somewhere between 10 big blinds and 15 big blinds per 100. So don't look at that and say, wow, that's, you know, I can expect to win 43 big blinds per 100 playing this way. No, you can't. It's just not sustainable. It's not going to happen. That's just positive variance on your side. So you're going to get negative variance. You're going to have some sessions where you win, you know, a little bit and you lose a lot. So don't look at my results and try to read into them too much. But overall, you know, um, I think this shows that playing an indie tag style can be a profitable style at the micro stakes, specifically at Bovada 5 and L because you don't have to get out of line with, you know, being too tricky with your play, trying to be too loose and trying to be too bluffy and trying to win every single pot. Um, you get, if you get in with some really good hands and you value town your opponents, you can do quite well at these stakes. So overall we're up five buy-ins. Um, yeah, I'm very happy about that, but like I said, I expect for it to go down. Um, looking at the graph, our red line looks pretty good. So a red line is our non-showdown winnings um, for the most part. You know, you can expect this to be um, a bit negative, but you just don't want it to be too steep. So, you know, overall it looks pretty good. And then, of course, everything else looks, else looks great going up for showdown winnings, um, overall winnings. And in terms of my all in EV, you can see that my all in EV is below my um, showdown and my actual winnings. So we were running good. So let's talk about reasons to bet, and this is something that I didn't include in the first video um, when I did a bit of a series overview for a Strategies for Success, and I really didn't go into detail during the live play. I think I touched base on these while I played, but let's go ahead and go through these um, just to give our beginning and losing players a reasons to consider when you're playing. So when should we be betting? When should we not be betting? When should we be folding? So when we are betting we first start there's only really two reasons and then there's kind of a third reason it's a consequence of the first two so the first reason is we want to bet for value 
And when we're betting for value, we have a strong hand or a very strong hand where we think it's the best hand and we expect to be called by worse. So when we have either the best hand or a hand that could be the best hand, we want to bet for value and we want to bet amount where our opponents will call us with worse. Um, there will be instances where you have a really strong hand, like say for example you flop the nut flush. You don't have to bet for value because you may not be called by worse. It may be better for you to check the flop show weakness and allow them to catch up. Um, but other times you have a vulnerable hand that's a very strong hand you want to bet for value now. So first reason of course is just betting for value and I put a note in there a lot of people will say I'm betting to protect my hand well no you're not betting to protect your hand um, I think that's a bit of an old concept and it's really not applied anymore in our games today but I think it was applied in the past and I think it's just people misconstruing the idea of betting prote for protection is actually betting for value so when you have a strong hand say for example you flop um, a weak flush like a four high flush on the flop and you're playing three ways your flush is vulnerable but you probably have the best hand so you're betting for value now but as a consequence for betting for value you're actually betting to also protect your hand so don't ever say I'm betting to protect my hand you're actually betting to f for value first and as a consequence you are betting to protect your hand the second reason is to bluff and to semi bluff so we can bluff when we think we can get better hands to fold. Um, you have to pick your spots at the markers, but if you think that you can get your opponent to fold a better hand when you are bluffing and representing a strong hand, definitely do so. So that's the second reason is to bluff, and I put in the semicolons is to semi bluff. So we're rarely going to be just purely bluffing. When we are bluffing, we do have potential equity on later streets, and that's considered semi-bluffing. So for example, um, you flop a four flush with an ace high on maybe um, a six high board. So you're not just purely bluffing there. You're purely, you're looking to semi-bluff there, and you're happy to take the pot down right then and there. But you're also happy to get called um, because you can also make the nut flush, or you can also make an ace for a better top pair and take down the pot. So we're semi-bluffing and bluffing when we can get better hands to fold, and we have equity on later streets. And then the last reason is to take down dead money. So. Taking down dead money is a consequence of both value betting and semi-bluffing, um, mainly bluffing. It's when we can get passive players to fold out their equity share of the pot. So if you think that your, play, your opponents will be playing a fit or fold style, you can go ahead and semi-bluff or bluff, and a majority of the time they will fold and they will give up their equity share of the pot. That may have equity against you on later streets. And so that would be our third reason, third reason is just to take down that dead money. So let's talk about reasons to call. So we're not always going to be leading out and betting ourselves, right? We're going to be calling as well, and then other times we're going to be folding. So why do we want to be calling instead of betting ourselves or raising? The first reason would be to still play a monster. Um, a lot of times in the micros we can just play ABC straight up poker and value bet a lot when we have a strong hand and fold when we don't. Um, but s there's other times where let's say we're not the preflop aggressor, we flop a really strong hand like say for example we flop a set of deuces on a 9-5 deuce rainbow board. Um, there's no reason for you to lead out and start betting there. You want your opponent to bet and value on themselves. So for example, they may have an overpair, they may have Broadway cards. Um, you're fairly certain you have the best hand a majority of the time when you flop the set. So you don't want to lead out yourself. You would rather slow play this type of hand, at least on the flop. And so what you want to do is be taking a check call line and let your opponents value on themselves. So this is very um, opponent dependent. If your opponent is the type that's bluffy, or the type that's going to be c betting a large percent of the times or taking stabs at pots where you show weakness you definitely can slow play but if your opponents are playing fit or fold and they're playing passive then you can just lead out and value bet yourself the second reason to call is when you have strong draws so again for example you flop um, an open end straight draw or double gutter straight draw or flush draw and you have a draw to the nuts 
you don't always want to be leading out. You don't always want to be taking a check raise line. Sometimes against specific op opponents in specific pots with multiple players and you can just take a call line. Um, and so definitely do so, but when you do so, make sure you're either getting proper pot odds if it's an all-in situation or if it's not an all-in situation and there's more money behind on later streets, you're getting decent implied odds. So we want to look at the, pot, the odds and if the odds aren't good, we definitely don't want to be calling, but if they are good odds, um, definitely we should be calling. The next reason to call is if our opponents is bluffing. So if we think our opponent is bluffing and we have a hand that's a bluff catcher, say for example we have middle pair, top kicker, or we have top pair with a weak kicker, um, we can call and we can continue to call with our strong or semi-decent hand if we think our opponent's going to be bluffing and just call them down with our bluff catcher and let them value on themselves. Um, this isn't going to be as frequent in the micro stakes as it is in higher stakes where players are more aggressive but if you have a player that uh, over um, overestimates the value of a weaker hand you can definitely just call down with a bluff catching type of hand where it's not strong enough for you to take a check raise line or you to lead out yourself so consider that situation I know I said before your opponents aren't bluffing as much as we'd like to think they are in the macros, but it does happen and you have to identify the opponents that are doing that and if they are doing you can take that type of a line uh, the last reason to call is to float your opponent. So floating is when you don't have much equity on the flop and your opponent leads out and you want to see a, a card on the turn. So floating is that concept where you're just going to call to see another card on the turn. Um, we can float when we have decent equity. Say for example we have ace-queen and it's a a 10-8-4 type of board and our opponent's given us decent odds to float. We can float with overs. Um, and we can definitely float more often when we think our opponents are c-betting a large percentage of the time. So when our opponents are c-betting a large percentage of the time, they're c-betting with air. They don't always have a pair. They just themselves, they may have um, a decent hand, they may have a semi-decent hand, or they may just have junk and they're c-betting to take down the pot, hoping you'll fold your equity share. So we can float in those situations. And we can also float, um, and this works more so when you're in position, um, we can also float when we think our opponents will see bet one time on the flop if they miss and give up on the turn. We can float to take down the pot on later streets um, if they're going to fold to any aggression from us. So definitely look at those opponents as well because you'll have a lot of opponents at the market stakes where they'll take a stab at, at the pot on the flop and if they miss they'll check fold the turn. So that's another reason that we can float. So let's lastly look at reasons to fold. So when should we just be giving up and folding to a hand? Um, well, when we have little or no equity. So for example, we have king of hearts, ten of hearts, and we called a preflop raiser. And let's say we called and three other players called. Um, the flop comes four of spades, six of spades, seven of spades on the flop. and we have a player go has head and he bets out and we have two callers. Um, on this flop you're not going to really like anything on the turn for the most part. You're not going to like a king of spades, a ten of spades. Um, even if you do hit a king or ten on the turn you could already be behind. Somebody might have came in the pot with a small pocket pair. They may have called with um, suited connectors or suited um, one gapper or they may even uh, have called with the spade draw and hit their spades. So you could be so far behind where you have next to little or no equity. And in a situation like this, it's just not a strong enough hand to continue. And when we don't have a good hand, we should just fold. Especially when there's multiple players in the pot and people are calling bets. So the next reason to fold is when our opponents are showing a lot of strength. So when an opponent's showing great strength, um, default to the Beluga Theorem. And this is more so the case on turns and rivers. So if your opponent is taking a check raise line or they are just showing great strength and leading out for a pot size bet, assume they have a very strong hand and assume that you are beat, especially if they're taking a check raise line. So for example, we can go back to this first example here. We have King 10 of hearts suited and the board flops uh, four, six, seven. Um, we see bet out, two players call on the turn, you hit, let's say, the king of diamonds. You lead out again and you get check raised. Um, and you get check raised to three times your bet. Um, 
here in this instance you can assume about 99 probably 100% of the time that your king is no good and she should just fold so again you know when you have something like just top pair or you have medium pair top kicker and your opponents are just playing back at you or they themselves are leading out and they're showing great strength just go ahead and fold your hand um, a majority of the time you're just going to be behind and this just gets back to my concept that I talked about before Marcus Sake players don't bluff that often, so don't assume that they're bluffing you or somebody bluffing you, especially on the turn, and most especially on the river when there's no more cards to come. The next reason to fold is when you're getting a bad price. So I talked about when you could call in the previous slide, um, when you have a strong draw such as a double gutter, um, an up down straight draw, or the nut flush draw, or maybe a, you know, a four flush draw where you have um, one card that's a flush you know you need to consider are you getting the proper price to call and if you're not getting the proper price you should definitely fold because when it comes down to it um, Texas Hold'em is a game of mathematics as well as everything else but if you're not getting a good price you're gonna get yourself in a negative EV situation in the long run it's a losing situation and I pretty I put a pretty simple example here so say for example you're getting two to one odds on a gut shot a four outer draw um, on any street, let's say this is the flop, you have four outs, you have roughly 8% equity to call if it's not all in, and if somebody's forcing you to put around 33% more into the pot, I mean, there's a huge gap between the 33% and the 8% you should be calling. You know, if it was closer to around 12 to 16% where you can make up that equity, definitely it's easier to call, but if they're just really giving you a bad price, don't chase your draws. Um, in the long run, you're going to end up losing money. And then lastly, the last reason the fold is reverse implied odds. So for example, you have top pair, a very bad kicker, like for example, I have ace-3 offsuit, and you're on an ace-10, queen-9-4 rainbow board, and you're facing a lot of action. Um, you know, either your opponent's been uh, betting three streets of value, or you got check raised on the turn of the river. You can assume a majority of the time your top pair with the weak kicker is probably never good. Um, you could be facing two pair. Your po opponent, even if they don't have two pair, you, you're out kicked by anything. The only thing you beat here is ace deuce. So consider reverse implied odds in these types of situations and fold to those as well. Don't assume I have top pair, I'm going to call. Um, you know, that's just a mistake that beginning players will make. But we don't want to make those ourselves because we're just be value owning ourselves over the long run. So that concludes what I wanted to talk about. I talked about. Um, reasons to bet, reasons to call, and reasons to fold. I know these are fairly simplistic, but they're designed for beginners in mind. So, you know, when you're trying to apply these, take these as a grain of salt. And those of you that are watching this, those specific that are intermediate and advanced players, I know that I left other reasons out um, in terms of betting, calling, and folding. But I think this is a decent introduction specific, specifically for beginning players. And then lastly, um, if you're interested in a 10 nl series, definitely let me know. Um, I'm definitely interested in doing another series. Let me know um, what you thought about this series. Let me know what you liked and what you didn't like. Let me know um, if you liked it when I had a guest speaker on here, um, such as Reg, that was sweating me. Let me know if you liked the live play or the hand history views. Uh, and definitely let me know if you liked the lecture portion, because I definitely don't mind lecturing myself. Um, have a bit of a background doing some lecturing for undergraduates when I was in grad school and afterwards. So I don't mind doing lectures if there's a topic you want me to do, a lecture type of a um, series, or even just, you know, maybe one or two videos as a short series. Let me know. And lastly of all, thank you for watching. So I appreciate everybody watching. Um, and I just want to clue, conclude this with saying that, you know, I myself, I'm not a coach. I'm not an expert at the game, so I know I have leaks in my game. Um, if you've seen any leaks, if you see anything you think I need to fix, let me know myself, and I'm going to try to institute myself and always look to improve my game. So thanks so much. Again, microgrinders, um, good luck on the tables grinding yourself. If you have any questions, inquiries for me, post them on the forums, and take care.